Mr. President, socialism does not work. And if you wish to see the evidence for this self-evident proposition, look around you. We've had more than 100 years of an active political socialist movement in Britain. And yet I see here, raised on a dais, three young men dressed in aristocratic dress of some years ago, <laughs> elevated above us all the very image of privilege. And they look as if they are, they look as if they are. <laughs> Socialism still hasn't swept them away, and I want to know why not. Because they, they look as if they're about to go off and pose for the, one of the famous Bullingdon Club photographs. <laughs> And they, they probably reckon that might come in handy in 20 years' time if they're making a certain job application. <laughs> I remember 20 years ago when I was making a certain job application, the fact that I couldn't afford the white tail, tie and tails and couldn't afford the membership of the Bullingdon Club was obviously the main reason, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, why I didn't quite make it to that ultimate requirement of the politician's trade to be Prime Minister. But these three gentlemen are obviously getting ready. Privilege is alive and well. Socialism has failed. <laughs> and what wonderfully tame revolutionaries we have with us today. Uh, you very kindly invited three socialists and communists into your midst. Uh, you sent them very clear instructions, uh, as they did me, uh, to come dressed as a sort of middle-class diner of the 1950s, <laughs> so that we knew our place beneath the president in his arist aristocratic <laughs> white tie tails. And you found such stalwart revolutionaries that at least the two males didn't comply with the dress code and have made their very strong protest. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why socialism doesn't work. Because when you invite a socialist to an elite institution and offer them a good dinner, they turn up and they eat it. Or they're late for the dinner, but they wish they turned up and eaten it. And although they don't obey the dress code, they play by your rules and they go along with the way it all works. Now, they're not stupid to do that because they have a much better life playing along with the rules, going along with the toffs and the establishment. Uh, than if they were really serious about their idea of continuous revolution. If you want to know the difference between uh, socialism and freedom, I think one very good way of looking at it, for those of you uh, who are privileged enough to have cars, I'm sure some of you have got rich parents and have managed to be given a car, others of you will get very well paid jobs and then you'll have the joy of owning your own car, one of the uh, great items of freedom in the modern capitalist world. They didn't tend to have cars for people in, in the communist systems, apart from the people at the top who stole most of the money. Uh, but I think one of the ways of drawing the distinction between uh, socialism and freedom uh, is the difference between traffic lights and the roundabout. You know, how socialist are traffic lights? They are the very embodiment of what we've been hearing about. They are organized by a government elite. They are top down, they're very expensive, they often don't work very well. Uh, they, <laughs> They proceed by clear mandates and instructions. You would be arrested and fined if you disagreed with them. Uh, nobody supervises them properly. Very often they're wrongly phased, so you can sit in a very long traffic jam on the busy road facing the red light, and the green light is obligingly letting no traffic through on the empty road adjacent to you. In London, they come up with an even better socialist vision of traffic lights, because we now in central London have some traffic lights with all red phases. Uh, on all the roads, absolutely perfect, so you can then frustrate everybody and create a massive traffic jam <laughs> in the hope that there is that one random pedestrian who wants to cross both roads <laughs> at the same time. I, I have sat in many of these traffic jams. I've never yet seen the person that they're, they're designed to help who wants to cross both roads at the same time, but I live in hope that he, he or she is out there because I know it's very kind of our socialist thinking officials to have them in mind and to decide to disrupt the other 3,000 of us who want to use the, the traffic light junctions in this way. Whereas the roundabout, you know, what a great idea, you know, freedom loving, capitalists they would call it. I expect they're trying to take the roundabouts out in their constituencies uh, when they get back on Monday morning to the House of Commons because they're 
uh, yeah, very. Well, I think the others are following it very well. I'm sorry you're finding this. <laughs> Sorry you're finding this a stressful experience, but uh, as a frustrated revolutionary, I can understand. And I, I must say, there are still some few roundabouts left out there, so you've got a bit more work to do, even on trying to get socialism to abolish the roundabouts, because the roundabout is the very embodiment of freedom. Uh, you're allowed to choose your own speed of deceleration and acceleration. You're allowed to make your own decision about whether it is safe to cross the roundabout or not. Uh, and far from being individualistic, it is a very collective experience because you've got to guess and sympathize with what the other people are going to do in approaching the roundabout, uh, otherwise you might hit them. And I have fortunately never seen anybody hit someone else on a roundabout because we are very social beings and when we're allowed to exercise our independent judgment, it works extremely well. That is freedom. I give way. If this Because America has a mixed system, and the one bit they've got wrong is having all these traffic lights. But they have many other fine aspects of freedom which does work. And I agree with you that I think it's a great pity uh, that the land of the free hasn't quite got it on roundabouts because they are <laughs> the, the, the very embodiment of freedom. They also have rather too many lawyers. Many of you will probably become very expensive lawyers, but that can be damaging. I give way. There's somebody over here. Well, welcome to the real world. That is great. <laughs> that, is, that is very reassuring. No, no, you, you've dominated the debate so far. I'm gonna, I'd just like a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. You know, we've, we've had many minutes from you. So, when, when I was um, a minister, one of the very interesting duties I was given uh, was on the death of Ceausescu, the, the communist tyrant in Romania. I was the first British minister to go and visit. And I was asked to give a talk uh, to the leading university. And it was a very big hall like this with more galleries. And when I eventually broke through from my communist guards in order to address this gathering, because although Ceausescu had gone, there was still an interim communist government in place, I was introduced by the communist minister who said very clearly in Romanian, and they did translate it for me, uh, that I would not be answering questions. Uh, there was an intake of breath and menacing noises coming from the audience. So I overrode my host, unusual, but he was a communist and he was about to leave office. And I said, no, no, the, the minister has misunderstood. I will be taking questions. Thunderous applause broke out from half the audience. They were the ones who understood English. Uh, <laughs> there was then a pause, and there was a remaining translation. Thunderous applause broke out from the other half. And in the, in the question and answer session, they were far more responsive than all of you, but we, we can't uh, have everything in Oxford, I suppose. Uh, a prophet is never respected in his own country. Um, <laughs> the questions were really, really terribly sad. I remember one of them saying, do you have uh, army guards or police in your factories to make sure that people work? And I said, no, no, um, under our system, people willingly go to the factory and they do it because they're going to be paid. And they couldn't understand this. And I said, well, you know, they can earn more money if, if they turn up and do a reasonable job. And, and then I realized the reason they couldn't understand how just paying people money would be an incentive was that they had practically nothing in their shops that money could buy. They couldn't see the point of it. And I realized this because an old friend of mine in this university, now unfortunately deceased, used to be part of the workers' educational movement. And he used to be one of the hosts who would take visiting Soviets around London the few who were privileged enough to get a pass and were approved to withstand the pressures of Western capitalism. And so he used to take them, first of all, to Marks and Spencer's on Baker Street. And they were completely gobsmacked by the range and quality and the price of all the produce in this place, good value and wonderful. And they would say to him, is this the store that the, um, the, the senior party members or the government ministers are privileged to use? And he said, no, 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 this is the store for everyone. This is, this is where... Uh, your proletarians, in British terms, come to shop. If you want to see the smart people shop, I'll take you there, I'll take you to Harrods. And he would then take them to Harrods. They were even more gobsmacked, just unbelievable. And the thing that most peeved them was when he said, and by the way, nobody is banned or barred from Harrods. You don't have to belong to the right party. You don't have to know the government minister. You don't have to know the mayor. Anybody can go in if they've got a bit of money to spend. They don't even need to have a lot of money. They can just go and buy something 
at the lower end of the price range or they can just go and look. That is the difference, ladies and gentlemen, between communism, socialism on the one hand and a free society on the other. A free society delivers plenty, it delivers choice, it delivers opportunity. It means you can go from having nothing to having a lot. It means you can achieve something. It means you can give something back. It means that charities can flourish. It means you are allowed to make choices. It means that you use the roundabout with skill instead of sitting at the red traffic lights in a frustrating queue knowing that somebody far more powerful than you has yet again made a big mistake and has got the wrong phasing on the lights.